uh, in detail. Um, and I think it's time for me to give the word to Daniel. Yes, uh, thank, yes. You, Luke. thank you, Luke. Um, um, okay, so, um, um, I will first start, start with a start short with introduction. Um, today's topics, as Luke said already, is um, stress intensification factors and flexibilities. And uh, when, in what situations do you actually need these to be accurate? Um, so, stress intensification uh, factors are uh, stress multipliers for bends and fittings with respect to the nominal stress of plane pipe. Um, most of you will already know this. And uh, flexibilities, well, they speak for itself. Uh, flexibilities can be used to include the stiffness of fittings uh, or, or bands or teeth or um, nozzles in your piping model. Um, and incorrect flexibility factors for fittings um, may affect the results in your piping stress analysis in a bad way. Uh, it can also be that your, um, your results are conservative, but this is not necessarily the case. So uh, you should always um, assess your system in such a way that you know whether um, you need to focus more on your flexibilities um, and whether you're not being too optimistic. Um, I will end this uh, presentation with an example in PCL Gold well, where I will show um, how incorrect flexibility factors can affect your results. Um, so, before we start a short introduction on DynaFlow Research Group, I won't go into too much detail as uh, I know most of you have already seen this before. Um, well, at DRG we focus on three activities. Um, this is software consulting, um, oh, so, sorry, uh, this engineering consulting. We focus on uh, complex engineering, problem, engineering problems. And um, consulting is uh, the primary part of our business. Um, we also uh, continually fo um, uh, develop of work on software. We develop our own software programs such as BOSS Fluids and BOSS Pulse for flow analysis and position analysis. Uh, recently, we have also released uh, a pro program for uh, marking ISOs and speeding up your analysis or uh, modeling, uh, which is called ISO Tracer, which will be uh, discussed at the end of this webinar briefly. Um, the final activity is training. Um, well, we, we provide trainings, lectures. Uh, we also host conferences. And uh, these webinar series is also part of this uh, training and knowledge, ex knowledge exchange uh, activity. Um, well, as you can see, we focus on a multitude of, um, serv of consulting services. And these all fall under, uh, under the engineering consulting activity. And as you can see, the pressure and thermal equipment and piping, uh, where uh, SIFs and flexibilities also come in, um, is a primary focal point of our uh, business. Um, furthermore, it may be interesting for you to note that this webinar is based on the PCL Gold training course. So if you feel that um, you, well, you wish more, you re require more information regarding SIFs and flexibilities and how uh, these can be calculated and what the, what the background is of, um, of these, these uh, SIFs and flexibilities, you can also uh, check our training courses and uh, maybe you'll be interested in this PCL Gold training course. Um, okay, so let's start with the actual webinar. Um, I will first provide a, a general introduction to SIFs and flexibilities. So um, everyone knows exactly what, what, they, what they are and why they are important. I will also um, show you what the current guidance is in SMEP 31.3, um, what they say about SIFs and flexibilities. And um, I will finalize or conclude this, this webinar with a uh, example on how uh, incorrect flexibilities may affect your analysis or results in a bad way. Um, so, stress intensification factors are the stress multipliers for pens and fittings uh, with respect to the, the stress in plane pipe. Um, so, for example, CSR2 is a, a pipe stress program that many of you probably use. Um, is a one-dimensional program. It can only um, solve for actual and bending stress in the pipe in one direction, and it cannot um, accurately predict the, the stresses due to stress concentrations in bands or at T's. So um, in these cases, you, um, 
Caesar does it automatically. You have to multiply with stress intensity factors to predict uh, the accurate stress at these locations. Um, so stress, a stress intensity factor is the ratio between the actual peak stress at the, um, at the, at the fitting, so at the bend or T, divided by the nominal stress in the component. So, um, yeah, Mar Marco in the 1950s performed a, a large number of tests um, with respect to curved but welded pipes. Um, this is also uh, the basis for the um, the piping the, the rules in the P31.3 currently, the P31 piping rules, um, and well, these are from the 1950s, these uh, results, and um, they require, require some update, as you may think. Um, okay, so um, the stress intensity factors can be calculated using finite element analysis. Um, so although you can use the P31.3, you can also um, well, use more applicable data. You can uh, model your, your fitting in finite element package and uh, calculate the SIF yourself. Um, what you need to do is build the finite element mo model of the, the nozzle over the band or T. Then uh, you apply a bending moment on the component. So in this case, you would apply a bending moment at the end of the nozzle. Um, let me see if I can indicate it. So you apply a bending moment at this location. And um, from this bending moment, you can calculate the nominal stress. Um, you can um, use this equation uh, to, to calculate the stress, or you can uh, just read it from the finite element program. <coughs> um, then you uh, compute the actual peak stress at the interface. So you um, check what the stress is at, at the inter intersection between the nozzle and the, and the shell. And then using this equation, dividing the actual peak stress by the nominal stress here, you can uh, calculate the correct SIF and then use that in your uh, piping stress analysis software like CSR2. Um, okay, so Every time you uh, apply a moment, like in the previous slide, um, you can calculate the SIF in one direction. But um, you need SIFs in, in both the in-plane and out-of-plane direction, so you need to apply um, two different moments to uh, be able to calculate the two SIFs. Okay, then um, flexibilities. Um, Flexibilities are also calculated for each stress intensity factor direction. So, um, well, you, you can do this to um, more accurately, accurately determine the stiffness of your piping system. And um, this will result in a more economic and safer piping design. Um, PCL Gold, is all, which is also used for the example in the uh, end of the webinar, uh, can calculate the flexibilities together with the stress intensification factors. And uh, flexibilities, they are calculated by means of comparing the rotations and displacements of the finite element analysis results um, to beam type deformation. So, um, of course, stiffness is related to uh, the force and the deformation that results from this force. Um, so, why would you um, implement the flexibilities in your analysis? Of course, um, a very stiff uh, connection to your vessel will result in high bending moments and high, high forces in your, in your connected piping and uh, sh shell, if that's included in your model. And um, by including these flexibilities, you can reduce the bending moments significantly. Um, these are some examples of how um, T connections or branch connections can deform, uh, similar to um, to bends. They um, the connection overlies, so um, you can s imagine that this is an actual T connection. T uh, fitting has significant um, flexibility. Um, so, um, like elbows. 
the degree of distortion is also a function of the D over D ratio, so the thickness related to the diameter of the <coughs> of the fitting. And uh, the finite element analysis and test data also um, by Marco and later can um, well generates knowledge on how these fittings distort and how that affects the shifts and, and flexibilities because uh, well we already discussed how you can uh, calculate flexibilities and shifts from finite element analysis um, and according to the P31.3 in 2000 from 2012 in Appendix D you can uh, use this finite element analysis data as more applicable as more applicable data in um, in the, in the determination of your SIF and flexibility. Um, okay, so um, for low D over D ratios, uh, where the uh, piping is of, or the T is very thick related to the diameter of the of the of the T, um, the flexibility and the SIF are approximately one. So um, related to a rigid uh, intersection, there's not much. Uh, change so in this case it doesn't really matter if you include flexibilities or not um, for high D over D ratios um, however which means uh, thin fittings the flexibility is significantly maybe significantly higher than one and uh, they should be accounted for um, so what is what's what's often done in the piping stress analysis is that the intersection or the connection to a vessel is uh, considered. <coughs> excuse me. It's considered an anchor, um, and this well, it could be conservative, but it's not necessarily so. It's not necessarily conservative. So it should be um, you should you should assess and make sure that you are not being too optimistic or uh, produce unconservative results and um, by including the flexibilities um, well you you uh, more accurately mimic the real situation so you'll be um, closer to the truth um, so I'll, well, I'll, I'm going to focus uh, on the current guidance in SME P31.3 and uh, why the, the flexibilities and SIFs are, um, well, can cause problems in your analysis. Um, so this is uh, from Appendix D in, in P31.3. Um, and flexibility factors and uh, stress intensification factors for in-plane and out-of-plane are provided in the P31.3. But as you can see, there's no distinction between the SIFs for the branch and the header pipe. Um, and you can imagine that, for example, for really uh, large diameter headers and small diameter branches, there will certainly be difference between stress intensity and the header and the branch. And then you also see that for uh, T, T fittings, the flexibility factor is, is one, which means that, um, well, this, this means that the intersection is considered to be rigid. Um, yeah, well, this, as you saw in the in the uh, illustrations earlier, this is certainly not the case for uh, many situations. Really, for uh, for thin thin wall of thin T, so thin wall pipe, you certainly have to consider flexibility. Um, <clears throat> There are some limitations to uh, the, the guidance provided in P31.3. So, so uh, for example, the P31.3 SIFs are not valid for large D over D ratio. So really thin, um, thin pipe or thin T's, the flexibilities or SIFs are not applicable. And in these situation, situations, you can use finite element analysis to calculate the SIFs. And um, for large D over D ratios, so um, for situations where the diameter of the branch uh, approaches the diameter of the header, the P31.3 SIFs may be non-conservative. They can even be off by a factor of two or three. And since this is also the safety factor used for the fatigue analysis, this can be dangerous. And um, as indicated in the P31.3 Appendix D, the selection of the correct SIF or the appropriate SIF is the designer's responsibility. So it's your responsibility to make sure that you are using the correct uh, SIFs and flexibilities. 
um, <clears throat> it's also indicated that um, the stress intensification factors and flexibility data in uh, Appendix D should only be used in the absence of more directly applicable data. And um, well, this directly more more applicable data may be the um, finite element analysis. Um, <clears throat> in uh, light of these limitations, um, the ASMES um, of the Pollen Research Group has uh, done uh, exploratory research in 2013. Um, with the intent to improve the accuracy of the uh, piping analyses um, related by the correct um, or by using the correct flexibilities and stress intensification factors. Um, <clears throat> this, um, this document uh, contains recommended changes to B31.3 Appendix D, so uh, the document that shows the flexibility and SIFs. Um, it has been known since 1987 already that um, a number of these SIFs are incorrect and that the um, flexibilities may also not be um, correct. For example, the omission of, of flexibilities for branch connections, uh, branch connections in Appendix D is a known source of potential error in piping system analysis. Um, this document, SME STLLC0702, provides more applicable data to address these issues. So, um, <clears throat> this document provides more, um, you know, they're also more complex but more accurate equations to calculate the SIFs. Um, and um, the changes in uh, SME STLLC are based also on. Um, the WRC329 by Rodebo and STPPT073. Um, this uh, VSA um, 329 was uh, published in uh, 1987 by EC Rodebo and uh, this document already indicated uh, the, the uh, potential errors that could be caused by um, <coughs> or the, the potential errors that could be um, well, that result from using the that could result from using the, um, the guidance in B31.3. Um, so these are some examples from uh, the WRC 329, and um, <clears throat> you can see that, um, for example, here um, you see that. Um, by um, considering a, f a flexibility of one for branches, you can be um, you can have a flex flexibility that's um, much much uh, smaller than uh, it should be. Um, so B31.3 specifies a flexibility of one for branches, and then uh, where it actually sh could be in some situations, be for example, be almost 47. And this leads to an overestimation of the bending moment by a factor of nine. So um, this is significant, significant error. And uh, here you can also see that um, if, if the SIF um, factor may be off significantly. And um, let me see. This is yeah. This is um, related to this uh, comment is related to the fact that. Uh, B31.3 doesn't differentiate between the uh, SIF in the branch or the or the header. Um, yeah, you can see this on on the on the next slide. Um, here, for example, you see a, a really small branch and a large header, and for um, the case of the for the for the situation in, in uh, B31.3 indicated down here, and they say that the stress intensification factors is is, uh, is can be calculated using these equations, but they don't differentiate between the branch and the header. So basically, it say it says that the stress intensity factor should be applied all around the the header, but um, common sense dictates that well this branch will never make the header fail at this location. And uh, this also, um, as you can see on the right, it's, it's, it's indicated in the WRC329 that 
code requirements are obviously silly and um, of course yeah, this this um, yeah this, this <laughs> nonsense um, you see that the stress intensity factor for the side of the header here is is nine and um, if we look at the actual uh, stress intensities at this location so um, this is um, a SIF uh, calculator provided by Pollen Research Group and here you can see the um, stress intensity factors as uh, calculated by the uh, document that's based on the research conducted by Pollen Research Group in 2013 and they have um, solved the problem that um, that is well they, they differentiate between the SIFs in the header and the branch and then you have the P31.3 SIFs where they don't differentiate between the header and the branch SIFs. And then um, there's another section from ESME that also, well, they, they have um, included it, but it's, it's not, um, well, it's less conservative than B31.3 or less uh, off than B31.3, but it's still uh, a bit too high. Um, and down here you can see that um, P31.3 overestimates the stress uh, 8.6 times related to STLLC0702 and um, well <coughs> this SIF as you can see uh, STLLC0702 is really close to the finite element SIF since these equations in STLLC0702 are based on uh, finite element analysis. So by using um, the SIFs and also flexibilities from um, SDLLC0702, you may be um, avoiding yeah, errors that can um, significantly um, can cause significant problems in your in your stress analysis. Um, okay, so now I will um, show you an example where I uh, indicate how the incorrect flexibilities can uh, can cause problems. Um, okay, I will um, start up uh, PCL Gold. This is the software this which which can be used to um, to calculate um, to calculate shifts and flexibilities in your in your pipe stress analysis. Um, I just have to share the. Um, share the program. Um, let me see. This, is this one. You should now be able to see the uh, input screen and the uh, 3D view of the model. Um, so, on the right here, you see um, the model that I've prepared. Um, you see a, a piping model with uh, several connections along the main header, and um, a nozzle in a vessel at the end and um, well uh, from the search analysis it, it was uh, concluded that a, a search load of uh, 230 kilonewtons um, is applied here or can be can be um, occurring in this location um, so we apply this in our stress analysis and um, well, when you um, when you use the SIFs as uh, calculated by B31.3 for these T's, we focus on on these T's now. Um, the B31.3 says, okay, you you can say that the flexibility for these T's is one. Um, <clears throat> so um, the flexibility of one means actually that the connection is rigid. Um, so we uh, go into the uh, piping input and go to the SIF and K data and um, these uh, T's, these are all the um, T's of these connections and um, when we scroll down to the end you can uh, specify how the stiffness should be calculated and uh, now I have put the stiffness on rigid which means that the K factor used is uh, equal to 1 and um, we are going to see what the, uh, the 
the lateral or the circumferential force and moment are at the nozzle to the shell. Okay, so um, <clears throat> when I run the model, I've already uh, applied the surge load. Uh, I just, I'm just, just make sure that you can see the uh, results file. Um, so when I look at the restraints load for the um, for the nozzle and the shell, this is node one four five. This node, you can see that the <coughs> the force in the x direction, which is the circumferential direction, is uh, fifty one kilonewtons, and uh, the moment around the uh, the y axis is one hundred and eight point one uh, kilonewton meters. Um, let me just write this down on the screen so you, we can uh, keep track of what happens. Um, so, for this situation, K is 1. And um, we have a... Uh, I'll, let me just uh, write down the moment around the vertical axis, which is uh, 108 kilonewton meters. Um, so, okay, um, this is what we should get when we uh, calculate this. Uh, we calculate the, the nozzle loads based on uh, B31.3 uh, flexibilities. Um, <clears throat> now, when we uh, go back to the input and um, we specify a um, stiff uh, well, here you can see you can you can uh, select different codes to calculate your uh, flexibilities, but um, let us now calculate the stiffs, the stiffness, the flexibilities according to finite element analysis. Um, this will take a little longer because um, um, the program needs to solve the uh, finite elements uh, calculation for the T. Um, Okay, so um, this should be um, this should provide more more accurate uh, flexibilities for for the T's, and since all these uh, T's are uh, the same, the program only calculates one T because they apply to all all T's similarly. Um, so now let's look what the nozzle loads has be, have become now. Um, so the nozzle was at node one four five. And we can see that the lateral load is now 80 kilonewtons, only almost 80 kilonewtons, and the moment around the y-axis is uh, almost 170 kilonewtons. Um, so as you can see, um, the K based on finite element analysis, we have a M around the vertical axis of 100 and 70 kilonewtons, kilonewton meters. So, as you can see, um, incorrect in this situation, incorrect shifts can have a significant impact on your nozzle loads. And um, well, you can also understand why this is the case because um, I have applied a um, a horizontal force at this location. Um, I, let me draw it again so you can show, see what is happening. Um, there's force in this location, and um, well, when we have very stiff T's, all these T's are very stiff. Then, of course, um, a lot of this this force is transferred to these connections here, and this means that the nozzle load here is relieved. But uh, now, if we use if we use more accurate flexibilities for these T's then, um, well, this uh, force will result in, um, in well, ovalizing at the, at the T's, and this will provide a larger deformation at the nozzle, resulting in a larger bending moment uh, in the circumferential direction. Um, so, yeah, you should, you should um, really check your, your layout and make sure that... Um, you're using the most 
accurate uh, representation of uh, reality and make sure that incorrect SIFs or flexibilities do not um, underestimate the, the, the forces that you calculate or the stress. Um, let me just uh, show you um, the other options. Um, so um, the finite element analysis is, of course, it's it's the most accurate. It's um, it's it's based on the finite element analysis for the the fittings where you specify the the SIF or the, the flexibility. But you can imagine that if you have a really large model, this uh, takes a lot of time because for each different uh, geometry of T or or uh, fitting where you specify the SIF, it needs to run a finite element calculation. So instead, you can uh, use the PRG manual, um, which is really close to uh, finite element analysis. Um, I can show you um, the results for this. Um, also, see that the, the run of the model uh, takes uh, yeah, well, takes a, a much less time than a finite element run, and certainly this is certainly the case for uh, very large models. And um, you see that, um, well, it's even a little higher than, uh, than finite element SIF, so we are a little bit conservative here. Um, so the flexibility calculated by uh, the PRG manual is a little higher than uh, by finite element analysis, but um, you are conservative in, in this situation, so um, this can save you the uh, time to run the model and still have uh, will be be more accurate than uh, B31.3. Um, well, finally, I uh, just want to show you that the non-option, you can also uh, yeah, ig totally ignore this uh, flexibility, and then um, the only thing that is that is uh, included in the in the model is the bending of the attached piping and uh, localization of the fitting is is not. Um, not considered in any way. Um, okay, so um, this was all for today. Um, I will now uh, go back to the presentation, and um, we have some. Let me just raise this. Um, oh, go back to the presentation. Um, yeah, so um, I've just showed you this, that um, incorrect SIFs and flexibilities, and um, primarily flexibilities in this case, may result in significant errors in your uh, stress analysis. Um, and as you, as you saw, the PCL goal, in PCL goal, the SIFs and flexibilities can be calculated using finite element analysis, uh, amongst other methods. So um, you can definitely investigate how uh, different flexibilities may impact your results. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel, for that uh, very nice presentation. I think it was a really clear update about the current status of, uh, of these SIFS values. Um, now, we received several questions. Before we go to these questions, um, of which I selected a few that we will discuss. Just a few, uh, a quick update about our upcoming events, and this is also related to the topic that Daniel presented today. Um, because on the 19th and the 20th of May, for those who are uh, uh, in Europe or, or close to the Netherlands, we have a training scheduled provided by Tony Paulin himself, so the, the original um, researcher and an engineer who did all this work. Uh, so 19 May, FEA Tools training seminar, and on the 20th of May, a Nozzle Pro training seminar, and especially on the 19th, FEA Tools training seminar, Tony himself will discuss this topic in a lot of detail. Of course, we also have a lot of webinars scheduled um, on May 11th and 18th how to use Isotracer to reduce modeling time, but I think most of you will already see this in a minute. Um, solving vibration problems in a two-phase flow line on the 1st of June and avoiding surge pressure failures 
in pipelines due to water hammer and enclosed air pockets on the 6th of July. So all interesting topics and we hope to see you uh, during these webinars as well, of course. Now going to the questions, um, I've selected basically two, uh, I've done it, we received quite a lot of questions and uh, just to be sure all questions will be answered uh, even, uh, even if they are not uh, discussed now, they will be answered in email later, uh, later uh, today. Um, so the first question, Daniel, that, that we received, I think that is a fair question. Um, how can I implement all this knowledge um, when I'm not working in PCL Gold? Um, okay, that's, that's indeed a good question because uh, PCL Gold indeed gives a lot of possibilities to include uh, flexibilities or calculate flexibilities and stress intensification factors based on different uh, codes or, or uh, methods. And um, <clears throat> although um, you, you may not have this option in your piping uh, stress package, package. Uh, I know for example in CSR2 you can specify stress intensity factors and flexibility factors, although you cannot automatically calculate them in that, in that software. You can use uh, this document, for example, SMSTLLC0702 and use the equations specified in that um, in, in that code um, to calculate your uh, stress results. Um, and well, if you if you don't have this document, you can. Um, yeah. In addition, of course, next to PCL Gold, um, you also have FEA tools, which can be used in uh, concert with CSR to calculate the flexibilities and SIFs. And um, if you also don't have this package, then uh, you can always use a finite element package to calculate the SIFs and flexibilities yourself. yourself. Of course, this is a lot more work than automatically calculate them using FEA tools or PCL Gold or the SME documents. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for uh, for answering this question. The second question is: You explained to us uh, basically what the history was about this research. Um, can you explain a little bit? Like, is it accepted by the SME code to use it? Can we can we use these values? What does the appendix, etc., tell? tells us about this. Um, okay, that, yeah, that's also a fair question. I uh, Let me just go back into the presentation a little bit. Um, because in uh, Appendix D of the P31.3, there are uh, several notes at the end. And then um, it says that um, the stress intensity factors in uh, P31.3 Appendix D may be used in the absence of more directly applicable data and um, the selection of appropriate SIFs and the flexibilities is the designer's responsibility. To so um, design, the designer is uh, allowed to use more directly applicable data for uh, your pipe stress analysis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as I've said before, the, the remaining questions will be answered by email later today or in the coming days. Um, and I would like to uh, go ahead now with this webinar um, because the next topic, and that will be just for a few minutes, and, and I think it's a really interesting topic for all of those who model piping systems on a regular basis. Um, the next uh, topic is about um, is about the ISO Tracer software package that we recently released. So basically, we ourselves do a lot of piping analysis and a lot of uh, modeling, therefore, and we ran into the situation where we um, will have to spend quite some time uh, modeling and marking ISOs um, instead of focusing on the actual engineering, which, which we think uh, should be the, the main part of all the work. Um, so we try to solve this, this issue. and, and I think we uh, did a great jo great job in developing the software package ISO Tracer. Um, so ISO Tracer helps us to to do these topics to go quickly from the uh, drawing to the model and then also from the model back to the drawing. Um, so basically, 
what we have seen, like before going to the software, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the advantages that we have seen ourselves. Um, what we've seen is that we can model our piping systems 50% uh, faster than before. Even, even those colleagues or, or people that were really uh, profound in modeling in, in CSR in our case, um, once they, uh, you know, were uh, effective with this software with Isotracer, um, they really could speed up their modeling. Also, we have automatic markings, which saved a lot of time and, and uh, a lot of, uh, well, it, it's work that is not that, uh, that interesting, of course. Uh, so it can be done much faster now. We can export the, the modeled, uh, uh, obviously the model in Isotracer to pipe stress packages. So that is uh, all quickly and, and easily uh, uh, done. It has an interactive 3D model, so that is one of the big advantages uh, for me, is that if I have a location in the system and I want to know the, the uh, related isometric, I just press on the location on the pipe segment and it automatically shows me the right uh, drawing. Superior quality control, I think it's clear that, that all the markings are very clear and, and you can, you know, change the colors and, and the sizes, etc. Um, so, yeah, a lot of better quality for marking with respect to, uh, to the drawings um, and, and doing it, uh, you know, by hand. And also ISO management, so uh, uh, shifting the order, uh, shifting the names and, and finding the right isometric for, for a certain uh, pipe segment is all done automatically. Uh, <coughs> Having said this, let's just go to the software quickly. Uh, I can show you, uh, I want to show you a quick um, demonstration. So basically what we have is here, we, we manage our isometrics, then in the middle we have the isometric shown, and on the right we create our model. So I'll just go ahead and, and make this model and explain a little bit. So the first thing that it does, is that it automatically detects the direction that you are modeling. So let's start in this case for ISO, uh, sorry, node number 1000. There we have our first marking. All right, so the length of this element is 6000. The thick, sorry, the diameter is 508 and the thickness 9.53. So we automatically see that the model is created here. Now if I press the next segment, we see that the direction changes automatically. The length of this piece is like this. Okay, so now let's go ahead and do this entire section at once. Now I'm going a little bit slow just to show you uh, how it works, but I think it's clear to see once you get a hand of this and, and uh, you know go fast through this model, uh, you can model it quite uh, quickly. Next segment. Three, four, nine. Okay, so now it continues on the next drawing. Let's just go there and press uh, on that location. So the node repeats itself. The isometric number is shown here. And we can continue modeling. All right, let's just see. The model works out great. Now, if I go in this direction, we see that the, the, the software automatically detects in which direction we are modeling. Let's change, put in the correct length, all right. Now we go down, again the software automatically detects the direction. All right, so here we have a valve with a length of 914. Okay, so this is a rigid element, so I press the R, you can see this here, it has a short key R, and it becomes a rigid, and we also see that in the piping model. Now I can continue with a length of 68, also a rigid, and then 914 again. Next element is a pipe again, so we make it, and we press the letter P, so that is again a pipe, and it has the length 3 997. Okay. Now oh, I forgot to uh, change the direction of these markings, so 
it continued doing it in this direction. Let me just fix that. Okay, so we see there, there are a lot of markings here. So I just by pressing the letter H, I'm just going to remove these two. I think that is sufficient. Okay, again, what is the weight? In this case, the weight of this valve is 1190. The weight of this one is 1190 also. And this one is 60. Okay, so now I have my valves and my basic uh, line set up. Let's go back to the original isometric um, and continue this line. I'll do this a little bit quicker. That was a mistake. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to continue the entire model. You can see that you can just drag all the node and all the markings. Um, so that it is uh, displayed correctly. This is again a rigid, so I'm going to press the letter R again. All right. And then this is a P, so let's press P and it becomes a pipe again. The length of this section is 4 for 1. Okay. So having finished this uh, branch, we see that again the software automatically detected the directions, automatically uh, set in the, the uh, rigid element. Now what I wanted to show you also is that, of course, in this segment, this entire segment was modeled at once. So we can just easily include the additional nodes by uh, pressing this one and we don't have to calculate it ourselves, just set in all the lengths, set one there which has a length of 1759. Let's see, this one is 5140 and here in the middle it is 2616. And then we have this one, which is 4766. All right, so now we have all our nodes uh, done. And we can see that you know, we included additional nodes in the middle, but the node numbering automatically uh, becomes continuous. And also on the next drawing, it just increases the value because these new nodes were added. Now, an additional feature, I won't be doing all the features, but basically you can build the entire model. But one feature that I do want to show is the uh, supporting. So in order to include the support, we have to define a new type. And this will be a Y support in a positive direction. And let's put in a friction coefficient of 0 0.4. And we can just include this uh, support. So we see the support, sorry, we see the support in the 3D modeler as well. And let's just include it everywhere where it is set. Um, to include this node first here. Okay. okay, back to the supporting. Select this one and press there. Yeah. Okay, and on the second isometric, I haven't defined the nodes yet, but I think it's clear that I can include the support. All right, so what we have to do here is also apply an actual stop like that. Okay, and we include the actual stop here, and there it is. Okay, so this way we can quickly define our model, all the lengths. There you have it. And now we can, once the model is finished, we can export the model and also export the isometrics. I will show this in a little bit, but first I want to show the fact that if you click on an element in your 3D modeler, it automatically goes to the correct isometric and also the location of that pipe segment. And also it, it will 
works the other way around. So if I press here, it also goes to that part of the model. So especially if you have more complex models, that really helps you to, uh, to find your way. And, and if you have a lot of isometrics, this becomes a real time solver. Okay, so having that said this, let's just show what happens if I export the uh, isometric drawings. Then we get this. You can see that it is really neatly organized and very clear. Also note that in this particular one I have included a, uh, a message if I want to show this to the customer. For example, I can do this, uh, a markup text. Let's just unselect first. If I press here you see that I can uh, include some example text. And this text is then displayed in the isometric. And once exported, it will also be included in the uh, in the in the marked up isometric. Okay. Final feature I would like to show is the export of the model. Um, okay. So if I would export this, I would just use this function put it as a Caesar 2 neutral file. Okay, export as a Caesar 2 user file. Okay. Now I myself use Caesar version 7. Okay. So now it is exported. And we can just open it and there it is. And we can quite easily open uh, this uh, this this uh, neutral file in Caesar. There we go. First we have to convert it, of course. Have a look at the... Neutral file, there it is. Convert, yes. All right. And now we can open it. And there it is. Okay, so we now have our model and we clearly see that all the features are included. The rigid elements, including their weights, these are automatically uh, translated into Newtons. And we also see that we have the um, all the uh, restraining included in the model and we can start uh, with the analysis. Okay, so thank you very much for, for listening. I've, I'm hoping that this uh, additional uh, part of the webinar was, was instructive to you as well. Now, if this is an interesting topic to you, you can always visit isertracer.com, which is the website of this software package, and it has all the uh, added values, the pricing, all information that you would need um, to, to have a look at this. Now, this is especially interesting because somewhere in the coming days, I think tomorrow or, or starting Monday, um, we will have a demonstration uh, feature on this website. So you can just download the demonstration package and start playing with the software yourself. Um, and then if you find it uh, useful for you and, and that it indeed saves time, you can, uh, you can start, uh, uh, you can buy it and, and rent it for uh, a, a while. Um, Okay, so thank you very much for, uh, for uh, listening to this webinar, and we're hoping to see you uh, in our next editions. Have a great day.